anything remotely to do with anything that's on the slide. Just throw something. <laughs> that cane would work just fine. <laughs> so that said, my goal, how about it? My goal is to talk about these things with you. It's gonna be really fast because I understand I only have about an hour. And um, to discuss and just a broad overview of one of, if not the most horrible genocide in history. See? Okay. So the first thing that becomes really important, the whole basis for the Holocaust is anti-Semitism. So there's a need for some backstory. So there's some context that makes sense going forward. And the Jews were living in Europe for over a thousand years prior to World War I. Most of it was, in every century, there was violence against them. It was referred to as pogroms. The more these pogroms happened, the more the Jews wanted to move away. They There was a lot of propaganda at the time. If you notice, what's important about this is not that. The glare, the accentuated, the exaggerated features, the strength of the glare, the way that the nose is drawn, the lips, always looks like someone evil. And it's important because the more that the propaganda gets around and the better circulated it is, the more opportunities people have to develop a prejudice against Jews before they even have any interaction with them. Okay. So most of the pogroms took place over here in far western Russia, including here what's considered modern day Ukraine. And between 1918 and 1932, there were 92,000 Jews killed just in this area. So the goal was for them to move away. The problem for Germany was for them to get over here, the goal was to get to the US, which is way over here somewhere. To get to the US, they were gonna have to pass through Germany. And the concern was that if they stayed, they would bring disease, economic corruption, and political radicalism. So they were concerned and they wanted them out. So these are the conditions that caused the whole environment that allowed the Nazis to come to power. After World War I, it was just, it was horrible. The, for the Germans, the punishments levied on them from the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I were really severe to them. It resulted in a lot of humiliation. The military was, had to be totally disbanded. They needed to get rid of all their arms and there was already existing rampant unemployment and a depression times 10, which only compounded when the US stock market crash occurred in 29. So Hitler was born, let's see, he was born in Austria in 1889, not in Germany. He lived in Austria until he was 16, I think, 18. He moved to Germany and he'd been deemed in Austria unfit for military service because he wasn't <coughs> considered physically fit enough. But then when World War I broke out, he went to Germany. Germany said, absolutely, come in the military. So he went into the German army and became a very decorated soldier by the end of the war. In 1919, he joined the small German workers party they were the precursor to the Nazi party. And in 1920, he was appointed the head of propaganda for the National Workers Party, and that's when he changed the name to the Nazi party. It's an acronym, but it's a bunch of German words that I have no idea how to pronounce, so I'm not gonna put anybody through that. So he's gaining a lot of popularity with his radical views he made the Jews scapegoats for everything that was going wrong in Germany. 
He was the reason that everything had gone badly with the economy. He was, the Jews were the reason that people were unemployed. So it made the situation right for a very strong speaker who had radical ideas who was gonna lead them out of this. So that's how Adolf Hitler came to be. The Democratic president was losing power in that interwar period, and they took a gamble with naming Hitler chancellor on July 3rd, excuse me, January 30th, 1933. And the reason that's important is because they thought, well, if we name him chancellor, then he's gonna have to moderate those radical views that he has, and that obviously didn't work out so well. This is the reason why the Jews are the primary target on this. It's just racism. It's where we see the age-old propaganda really becomes important here. The inherent physical traits, the religious aspect of it, it became more about what the Jews were than what they believed. So that racism takes on a, a different form in this time as, as Hitler's gaining in popularity. Hitler considered European civilization as the seat for human development. That whole idea rested upon the idea of purity of the blood, how to create the Aryan race. These are the archetypes. Blonde hair, blue eyed, I made a screen happen. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> it's now part of the picture. Um, the archetype here was the strong, vera looking, blonde haired, blue eyed, very Nordic looking. This was what Hitler wanted to create. And so what happened was he was going to need to create living space. That's what lives around me. And what happened was he needed to expand his territory to give the Aryans a place to live as the grace grew. And that meant that everyone else who wasn't an Aryan shouldn't be there anymore. This idea of the Aryan race took on a kind of scientific and pseudoscience had a lot to do with the physical traits, measurements of the head, the shape of the head, the noses in particular. I don't know what the obsession was all about with the noses, but he definitely had one. And then African Americans were also included here. Black people also were not a part of this, but they were, for whatever reason, they weren't included in the chart. So they used to use like a, a forceps to measure the depth of the cranium, the side of the skull, and all of these measurements basically meant whether you fit the bill or not. The first real act of violence against the Jews, in 1933 they boycotted Jewish businesses. And that sign says, Germans, defend yourselves, don't buy Jewish. In 1935, there were a series of laws. That's when the, the laws really started to become common. There were hundreds of decrees passed during this time, and it all meant that, okay. It all meant that the Jews were systematically, they were losing rights bit by bit. They had to have J's put on their passports, and this is the first that they have to be marked in public with the, the yellow star. Normally it was sewn into the clothing. While it was initially focused on the Jews, the Nazi government clarified that the Nuremberg laws also applied to the Roman Sinti that's 
who we generally refer to as gypsies. And black people, as well as any of those folks' descendants. They could not be full citizens of Germany because the Jews specifically had a native tongue, Hebrew, and because they had a native tongue, they could never learn to speak German properly. Even if they were born there and grew up there speaking German, they couldn't be German according to Hitler. The Night of Broken Glass was the second, well, the second well-known act of violence against the Jews that in that one evening, almost every storefront that was owned by a Jew was broken. There were also fires set, people were beaten up. The yellow star that the Jews had to display on their clothing. So lesser known murder. All of these things were instituted in order to purify the blood to, in the race to make the Aryan race. The genetic courts began in 1933 and there were 181 of them that were usually sat by physicians in the right, um, sometimes regular judges. And what they needed to do was to interview people and they decided who needed to be sterilized. And that came down to usually the folks who were feeble-minded, had schizophrenia, manic depression, retardation, physical deformities, epilepsy, blindness, deafness, and alcoholics, as well as the sexually promiscuous. The court generally, there was no finding of not guilty, right? I mean, almost everyone had to be sterilized. If you received papers and you showed up at court, it was happening. This was a mass program and about 400,000 Germans were victims. So these are the, this is a representation, this was propaganda that was handed around to support the idea of forced sterilization. The euthanasia program began in August 1939, and all medical staff had to report newborns and children under age three that showed any signs of physical or mental deformities. In October of that year, parents of children who appeared to have these conditions were encouraged to bring them to these specially set up pediatric wards. What they didn't know was, was that they were simply killing centers. The clinics were in Germany and Austria, and, excuse me, the staff murdered those children by way of lethal injection, or they just starved them. In that time, there were over 10,000 children killed. Action T4 was just an extension of the euthanasia program to include adults. There were six gassing facilities set up and the groups targeted were similar to the sterilization program, but expanded to include those who are not of German blood. So from January 1941, there were about 70,000 people who were gassed at these five facilities. This is hard time, and this is an example of a bus. They used to gas people in buses. They would paint the windows out so no one could see in or out. The Einsatzgruppen, translated directly as special action groups, were basically battalions of soldiers 
who followed the German army, and as the Germans seized territory, these battalions followed them. They were assigned areas where they needed to basically rid society of the Jews. Most of this was done using a shooting squad, firing squad, and later the Nazis decided because they were shooting all these people, it was stressing them out, basically. So then the gas vans again came into use and it was primarily over in, in this area of Western Russia again. In 1941 at Babi Yar, that's in northeast of what's now the Ukraine, there were 34,000 Jews killed in 24 hours. Believe, believe, <laughs> excuse me, between late 1941 and 1943, less than two years, the Einsatzgruppen killed over a million Jews. There were lots of ghettos, way more than what's on this map. This is just the ghettos that were around from 1940 to 1940, excuse me, 1941 to 1942. And for the sake of time, we'll just discuss the Warsaw Ghetto established in 1940. Warsaw had the largest Jewish population of Poland and at one point, the ghetto held 400,000 Jews. This is the entrance. This is the Jewish quarter, just a busy street. And the Jews, once they were all rounded up and put in here, they had to build the 10-foot wall that fenced them in. Conditions were deplorable. It was over seven people in a room, normally. All these families packed in these very small spaces. The whole ghetto was, I believe, 1.3 square miles. So if we put 400,000 people in 1.3 square miles, that's a lot of folks in a room. There were cafes and restaurants. There was a form of currency in the ghetto, but it really wasn't worth much. There was very little food, very little goods to go around. There was smuggling, however. People would come who sympathized with what the Jews were going through. They'd come to the outside of the wall and they would throw things over the wall like bread, uh, other goods, things to eat. And if the Jews inside the ghetto were caught picking any of these things up, they patrolled that area and they were immediately shot. So this is a Jew who's being interrogated by a Nazi for smuggling. And this is another Jew, she's obviously emaciated, and she's selling armbands. In the ghetto, the Nazis often amuse themselves by harassing the Jews. So here this bear definitely having fun. But there was widespread poverty, kids sitting in the street, nothing to eat. You can tell this child is very thin. And here, this was a typical scene that there were just, the dead just lined buildings. After the ghettos came deportation, so this is in Warsaw, helping the Jews get onto the cattle cars. The cattle cars normally had about 100 people packed into them, and the dimensions inside for occupants was about 27 feet long, 7 feet high, and 9 feet wide. Not a big place for over 100 people. A lot of people died along the way before they even got to the camps. There was very little air, no food, no water, maybe two buckets if they were lucky for a toilet.
The longest trip was from Greece. It took nine days to get to Auschwitz from Greece. So this is, these are just more scenes of the crowding and the box fires. This is a, a replica of a box car. You can see the inside of it. There were no windows, just these little, I don't even know what you call them, vents maybe. Um, but there's definitely very little space. And this is also a replica that you can see at the memorial, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. In the camps, there, were, there was a system for marking all the prisoners. Uh, it did vary from camp to camp, but everyone had to be readily identifiable. So the green triangles, I don't know if everybody can read this, the green triangles were for the criminals, the red, we know the, the Jews were the yellow, and they were really only triangles in the camps. If it was just a pure Jew, they would have two yellow stars, excuse me, two yellow triangles stacked on each other to make that star of David. If it was a Jew and they were also a criminal, it would be the yellow star plus an inverted black triangle. Excuse me. Yellow triangle, black triangle is what I meant. There were hundreds of concentration camps, hundreds of them. These are obviously not all of them, but these were the camps in uh, Nazi-occupied territory in Europe just for the year 1943 and 1944. Not all concentration camps were killing centers, but for our sake, we're just gonna stick to Auschwitz. I know I'm running out of time. These were the six killing centers, and each one of them had gas chambers, every one of them had a crematorium. But Auschwitz played a central role because that was the ultimate camp for the final solution. So Auschwitz was the primary extermination camp. It wasn't used for forced labor. Auschwitz II Birkenau was strictly for killing people. Auschwitz I, the main camp, was had one crematoria excuse me, crematorium, one gas chamber, and that was the first one established in 1940. This was where uh, Joseph Mengele did the medical experiments. He liked twins, um, little people, babies. He liked to experiment on them, and he, they also did experiments with adults. They would do things like inject them with seawater to, and somehow that was supposed to tell you how much seawater a German soldier could put up with before they died. After the four crematorium in Auschwitz II, when that construction was built, the one crematorium used in Auschwitz I was that stopped and it became a storage. In Auschwitz II, there were four more crematoria, and it's also called Auschwitz Birkenau. And those crematoriums were marked after this first one, so in Birkenau it was two, three, four, and five. Auschwitz II had the largest prisoner population. The camp was split into 10 sections, and every section was separated by fencing with barbed wire. There were Nazis and Nazis with dogs, SS soldiers who would patrol the barbed wire fences. And if you got caught anywhere near there, you were usually shot. If it happened often that if you were a prisoner and you just didn't have the will to survive anymore, people would go and throw themselves on the barbed wire, which was electrified, so they would be able to kill themselves. 
So each section was set up for different groups of people. You could say one section had women in it, one section was the family camp for the Roma and Sinti, and so on. Auschwitz Three Monoliths is one that most folks don't know a whole lot about. That was strictly a labor camp. But right nearby, there was a rubber factory. So most of the people who lived in Auschwitz III would work at that rubber factory. There was also a school there for non-Jews to be properly disciplined and educated if they weren't following the rules of German discipline. So this is the gate. This, the words mean work makes free. I never pronounce it correctly, so I'm not going to do that. Our bait mock fray, I guess. <coughs> It always seems like it's this huge thing, and it's, it's not. It's very small. This is the entrance, the tracks going into Auschwitz II, Birkenau. And this also, where the, the trains actually entered, also very small, barely big enough to fit a train through there. Prisoners were ushered into a single line, and then there was a physician, an SS physician there, who would begin selection. If you were sent to the left, that means you could live, and if you were sent to the right, that means you went directly to the gas chambers and to the crematorium. to a chamber. There were actually Jews who were 
recruited, and the Jews actually would tell the prisoners that they had to undress, that they were just going to take a shower, and then they'd be reunited with their families. And they would take their clothes off. They were told to remember what hook it was hung on. They would be herded into a gas chamber. The doors would be closed. The Nazis, on top of this, it was brassy, actually. This was all built underground. So on top, they were walking basically level with the land, and there were these like trap doors that would open. They opened up the trap door, turned the can over, and in about 15, 20 minutes, there were hundreds of people in here, and they were all dead. After that, the same group of Jews known as Sunder Commando, they would come back into the chamber and take out the bodies. The next thing that would happen is they'd cut all their hair off, and then they would open up their mouths and look for any old teeth or fillings and remove them. The gold that was taken, a lot of camp guards got pretty rich with those, with the gold fillings and the teeth. But what wasn't stolen by the guards was deposited into a Nazi bank account after it was, it was smelted. It was all smelted down. The Zunder Commando is a really interesting group here because they were handpicked by the Nazis and they were Jews. They were all very fit looking Jews, uh, ate a little better than the rest. They just, I guess, dealt with the, the trauma and all of the labor better than the rest did. So they would hand select maybe 14 or 15 Jews and they were the ones who were responsible, like I said, for getting the Jews down into the chamber where they changed, took off all their clothes naked and the Zunder Commando were then responsible to remove the bodies, shave the hair, remove the fillings, and then from there, they took them up an elevator, at least in Beer Canal, they took them up an elevator, and that's where the crematoriums were. So they would take them in. They would be taken basically upstairs, and the Zunder Commando, again, part of this group of people, would often see their family members and have to lift up their family members and put them on these trays and this is where the fire was. So this under commando is interesting because they kind of are, they're on both sides of it, right? The Nazis brought them into it and hand selected them to do it, but then they were also perpetrators as well. The living conditions for this under commando, they lived upstairs from on top of the crematorium. And where they lived, they had beds, they had actual bunks with mattresses, bless you. They also had better food than anywhere else in the camp. Anywhere else in the camp, if you were one part of the forced labor, you would get a small bowl with like hot water and a rotten vegetable if you were lucky. And the Zunder Commando definitely lived better than that. There was a lot of alcohol. Everyone was drinking alcohol all the time. The Nazis were definitely drinking alcohol all the time. And then the Zunder Commando, with the type of work that they did, they drank a lot too. The Zunder Commando only lived three to four months, and then they were all shot because they knew all the inner workings. This is an aerial photo taken. This is gas chamber crematorium two. Crematorium one down here shows you where the, the undressing view is. Excuse me, the undressing room, the Zyklon B vent, the gas chamber where that was. And this was actually taken by Americans. What's important about that is, is we didn't do anything about it. All of the headlines about this were buried in the New York Times. Nothing was front page. It was always a couple pages back in that first section. And unfortunately, no one acted. That said, the Nazis did an excellent job of trying to keep all of this secret. One of the 
most common questions is, why did Jews go like lambs to the slaughter? They didn't. They did everything that they could to survive. It was all about survival. So any adherence to Jewish culture was considered resistance. They had religious services that were conducted in secret, usually during the night. There were weddings. There was art and poetry. They did everything to maintain that culture. The schools, there were actually schools in the ghettos that took place. There wasn't a whole lot of schooling in the camps because normally the first people who were selected to go to the right and die were women, young children, and babies, and the elderly. There were also partisans. The partisans were an armed group of Jews who managed to elude Nazi capture. They lived in the forest, and somehow they would, they would get guns. I'm not 100% sure how that happened, honestly, but they would hide in the forest, and they would shoot at Nazis and attack the Nazis, and that's how they resisted. There was a Jewish underground movement in every ghetto. There were also uprisings in the ghettos and in the camps. So this is not going like lambs to the slaughter. They definitely did everything that they could to survive and to fight back so that they could survive. There were uprisings at the Warsaw Ghetto. There was one at Treblinka, another death camp, one at Sobibor, and one at Auschwitz. Auschwitz is interesting also, the uprising there, because it was mostly women who made that happen. A group of women worked at a munitions factory that was nearby Birkenau, and systematically they would get small amounts of gunpowder that they would wrap in a piece of paper or in a piece of cloth, and the women would, when they got back to the camp, they would put this under, under clothes of someone who died and was on their way to the crematorium. So there was basically a big wagon with corpses piled on top of it, and sometimes there were, there were women who had some sort of like makeshift underwear on, and they would take that little amount of gunpowder and they would stick it underneath just the end of the underpants. So when they went into go into the crematorium, then the Zunder Commando knew to look, and they just collected these little packs of gunpowder. Eventually, they amassed enough gunpowder to make makeshift bombs out of like 55 gallon drums. And in 1943, I may have that date wrong, excuse me, they knew, it got around that they were the next Zunder Commando to be liquidated. So that was when they took their opportunity and they blew up crematorium four. And after that uprising, that destruction caused the, that gas chamber, that crematorium couldn't be used again. Kinder transport, they, these are methods of rescue. Kinder transport from 1938 through 1940, there were groups of children Jewish children who were brought to Great Britain. So they were able to get out of town, basically, and escape murder. There were also Jews who went to the Far East, Shanghai, China, and Kobe, Japan. They stayed there, it wasn't, excuse me, a lot of the, the children who ended up in Great Britain stayed there permanently, but the prisoners who went to the Far East were a curiosity when they first got there, but then most of them ended up coming to the United States after. The Danish used smaller boats to transport Jews from Nazi-occupied Denmark to the non-occupied Nazi Denmark. Excuse me, non-occupied Denmark. So although the US, most of the world, Catholic Church, everyone turned their back on what was going on, 
there were definitely instances of rescue, and it was mostly by a small group of people. The movies. It's very interesting how all of this is portrayed in film. The one that everybody knows is Schindler's List, right? Pretty much everybody's seen that. That's like centrally what most pop culture is aware of, right? The biggest thing with that. But it was one isolated example of resistance. It was one isolated example of rescue. It wasn't the rule. It's a great movie. And everything with how that happened is pretty accurate, according to most scholars. But it's important to keep in mind that as an, it's an amazing film, but it's one isolated instance. It was not the rule, definitely not the rule, that a Nazi was rescuing Jews. That was, I think that was the only time that that ever happened. If you're looking for a film that portrays what the Zunder Commando went through in the gas chambers, the crematoriums, the Gray Zone is definitely that movie. It actually has a lot of big name Hollywood actors in it. Excellent film. The Pianist, I don't know how, how many people have seen The Pianist. Incredible film, incredible film. That is a great depiction of what went down in the Warsaw Ghetto and how after the destruction occurred in the Warsaw Ghetto, the Jews who survived that were able to hide in the rubble and escape. There's another film called Faithless. It's about the Hungarian Jews it is subtitled, I will warn you if you don't like that, but Fateless is an excellent depiction of what life was like in a labor camp. Not all the concentration camps were the same. They weren't all killing centers, right? There were only six of those. But in a labor camp, there would often be roll calls. So in the middle of the night, a Nazi guard would come in, they would make a whole lot of noise, yell, everyone would have to come down off of the bunks and go and stand in like a big muddy courtyard usually, and they would just have to stand there for hours. And Fateless is the best, the best depiction of that as well as what it's like to go home after. So liberation, these are, are two very common depictions of what soldiers found when they liberated these camps. I looked for these specifically, Dachau and Buchenwald were both liberated by American soldiers. And what some survivors described this as is, one morning, they weren't woken up, they just woke up and it was completely silent. And they didn't know what to do with that. So they went outside of the barracks and all of a sudden there are no Nazis. So they didn't know what was happening and later that day, Literally later that same day was when the military came to liberate them. After liberation, most survivors spent time in displaced persons camps until they could find another place to go. A lot of times when they returned home to those areas of Europe, they were leveled. And then they weren't greeted very well. For some reason, the prisoners were not welcomed back with open arms after they were liberated. One survivor from this area is named Severin Fairman, and he actually just passed away at the age of 92. He lived in Reading, just outside of the Reading area, and if anybody's familiar with Baldwin Brass at all, it's um, hardware, locks, doorknobs, cabinet poles, he created that factory from nothing, and now, almost 80 years later, it's still considered some of the best hardware you can get in the industry, and you can buy it at Lowe's. So a lot of the survivors, he really focused a lot on hope instead of the horror that he dealt with. Didn't talk a whole lot about what he went through. He was at Auschwitz, and he worked in a munitions factory, was obviously fit for that, 
When he lived in Poland, his family owned a tool and dye factory. So it all lent itself. Somehow, he was not the norm either, that his entire family survived that experience. And they all ended up finding each other, and they moved over to, ended up in Newark, of all places. And then he came and decided he just wanted to live in Reading, so he and his family came and they lived in Reading. So he's a definite, definite success story when it comes to how to deal with that trauma and that grief. Others can't talk about it at all and they're just tortured. And you can tell when you share space with them, it's like it radiates off of them. This is uh, a picture of one of the displaced persons camps. We don't know where this was. Nobody knows when exactly this photo was taken or where it was taken. As you can see, it's, it's really not that different from what a concentration camp setting was like, but there's a lot of food. So the numbers. The total of these figures, can everyone see that in the back? Okay. Six million Jews, 1.1 of that six million was killed at Auschwitz alone in three years. Soviet civilians were, there were about seven million of those, 1.3 were included in the six million Jews. Soviet prisoners of war, about three million, including about 50,000 Soviet soldier who, who were also Jews. Non-Jewish Polish citizens, about 1.8 million. People with disabilities who had been living in institutions, they <coughs> were not killed as a part of uh, the euthanasia or the T4 programs before the, the camps. They were killed, about 250,000 those. Roma and Sinti, the gypsies, between a quarter of a million and half a million. Jehovah's Witnesses, around 1,900. Criminals and other asocials, that's where the, the Roma and Sinti are often lumped in with the asocials. Uh, people who didn't want to conform, intelligent, well-educated people, they were included with the asocials. Homosexuals, uh, there were thousands no one really knows how many, and they were often counted as asocials as well. And then the German political <coughs> opponents, of which we know there were a lot, no one kept records of those numbers. So what was at one time about 12 million, the numbers have changed now with new research, and the total number, according to these figures, is 17,321,900 people. So lessons, this is a quote by a Lutheran minister. First they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. It's definitely, definitely condemns inaction. And it shows this all didn't happen in a vacuum. It was very gradual, right? You lose small increments of your rights and you just think, oh, okay, this is crazy, but it's gonna stop here. And then there's some other right that's taken away and you think, oh, this is even more crazy, but it's gonna stop here, it's gotta stop here. And all of a sudden there are concentration camps and ghettos and extermination centers and here we are. So this quote has come to be a very important one and it is the last thing that you see when you exit the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. 
Two-thirds of the world's Jews were killed, and in Greece, 93% of the Jewish population was gone. About 75%, or 4.5 million, of all the Jews that were killed lived in Poland, the Soviet Union, and other Eastern lands. Something to keep in mind, the policy of sterilization was not original to Nazi Germany. The policy was actually picked up from the Eugenic Center on Long Island. So we had a, a part to do with that, that racial profiling, that racial, all of the, the, the measurements and how to, to determine what race is were according to what they looked like in their bloodline. From 1904 to 1972, in that center, 70,000 Americans had been sterilized, primarily poor, young misfits, pregnant women. Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote for the majority of the Supreme Court and said, three generations of imbeciles is enough. This is a memorial to the murdered Jews of Germany, and this is actually in the center of Berlin. It's meant to look like a graveyard. And when I was there, it was, it was crazy to me that people were allowing kids to run around in and out of the, the memorial and playing tag. It just didn't, something didn't sit right with me. The shoes from the Holocaust Museum. Yeah, this is the display from the Holocaust Museum. For people that actually deny the Holocaust, I don't know how you can do that when you see everything that we've seen. Eyeglasses. The suitcases, this is a little fuzzy. I took that at, at Auschwitz, but here again, how can you deny these events when you see this? Okay, the technology of it all. <laughs> so that is about it, what I have to say. Fast and furious. Does anyone have any questions that I can try to take a crack at? Yes, ma'am. Um, 